This is Point Le Pro, New Brunswick, Canada, a tongue of rock and soil that extends about five kilometers deeper into the north side of the Bay of Fundy than any other land around it. That's why there's been a lighthouse here to guide ships since 1831. And because Point Le Pro runs deeper into the bay than the rest of the coast, the St. John Naturalists Club put its bird observatory here in 1996. They put it here because this is where the migrating seabirds pass. And what the naturalists at Point Le Pro have found since 1996 is that a unique and spectacular event happens here every spring. Migrating seabirds, ducks and loons mostly, pass by in the hundreds of thousands over the course of six weeks between late March and mid-May. They're on their way north to breed. Of course, they've been doing it probably every spring for the past 10,000 years, since the Bay of Fundy was formed at the end of the last ice age, and humans knew they came, native people, explorers, settlers, and residents along the coast. But until the naturalists at the Bird Observatory started watching and counting and writing it all down, no one really knew what kinds of birds or how many. The naturalists built their observatory here because they knew something was going on each year, but they didn't know how astonishing it would be. During the spring migration, in April and May, an average 700 birds pass every hour. That's the average. At the peak of migration, as many as 8,000 birds per hour have been counted. But even at 700 birds flying by 24 hours a day, that's nearly 17,000 birds every day. And that's just what the observers can see. No one knows how many birds pass by so far out in the bay that the observer's binoculars can't see them. There are common eiders and king eiders, red-breasted mergansers, red-throated and common loons, white-winged and surf scoters, but the most numerous by far is the black scoter. Over 50% of the birds that pass through the Bay of Fundy in April are black scoter. And the black scoter is one of the least known sea ducks in North America. Uh, its uh, eastern breeding grounds are virtually unknown. Uh, its life cycle is little studied. And uh, it becomes the, the most common bird that we have coming by the observatory. So it, it's particularly interesting. It's a, it's a black sea duck. The male is coal black, beautiful shiny black. It's a medium-sized bird, quite a stocky duck. Um, it's distinguishable very easily, the males, by a, a little orange knob on top of the bill, just where the bill joins the forehead. And it's really a very pretty bird. And the female's a, a browner bird with a sort of light sides on her face. Jim Wilson of the St. John Naturalists Club has been watching the birds fly by Point Le Pro for many years. Well, I first visited Point Le Pro in the spring of 1963, and it was in April, as I recall, about the middle of April. And we noticed these incredible numbers of birds coming through, mostly sea ducks, a lot of them scoters, black scoters flying through, surf scoters, white-winged scoters. And they seem to be just unending in the, the numbers that were coming. And one day I was down there and there was these skeins and skeins and skeins of birds coming past. 
And at the same time, an oil tanker, a super tanker, was coming up the bay on the horizon behind all these birds. And I said to myself, you know, what would happen to all these birds if there were ever an oil spill, a disaster of some kind like that? No one would have any idea of the number of birds, the kinds of birds for sure, uh, or the time when they actually pass, the beginning, the middle, and the end of it. So we decided that perhaps we should try to build an observatory at the end of Point Pro, a number of us in the St. John Club, to, uh, to monitor the passage of seabirds. The observatory opened in 1996. Since the start of the project, they've been carefully collecting data. The Canadian Wildlife Service and Bird Studies Canada have helped them with the collection of that data. Today, over 200 volunteers from all over the province come to the observatory to record the numbers of sea ducks passing, the kinds of birds they are, the direction they're traveling, the weather, wind and temperature. All of this is carefully recorded in a database that grows every year. From that information, year to year they can calculate the number of seabirds passing the observatory every hour in spring and in fall and whether the numbers are increasing or decreasing. All this data helps in the study of these birds. Everyone that comes down to Point Lepreau to do bird observations follows the same uh, procedure and same protocol. Um, 15 minute periods of observation followed by 15 minute periods of rest over a four hour period. So it gives a good sample of what is going by on any particular day. The information gained by the watchers at Point La Pro has already caused Mesa's Bay, this smaller bay within the Bay of Fundy, right next to the observatory, to be named an internationally recognized important bird area by Bird Studies Canada. There's still much to be learned, particularly about the black scoters. We know that many spend their winters in Chesapeake Bay, off the coast of the American state of Delaware. For months, they wait for warmer weather and longer days. And in March, it's time to move. Time to fly north. Time to breed. The birds flow up the east coast of North America until they reach the Bay of Fundy. It acts as a huge funnel, and an important part of that funnel is right opposite Point La Pro. When the birds reach the upper parts of the bay, they turn north. Some fly up the river valleys, the St. John, the Kennebecasis, the Memram Cook and the Petakodiak. Others cross the Isthmus of Chignecto and hug the east coast of the province, passing the Confederation Bridge to Prince Edward Island on their way north. Naturalist Kathy Popma has been observing the birds pass by here since the Confederation Bridge was built. In the spring, they come down the strait and just seem to land and float and look at the bridge and not quite know what to do. I feel, and I think others feel, that they probably move at night and we haven't been able to prove that, but the feeling is maybe the bridge isn't as intimidating to them at night, although it's lit up. The birds may initially have seen the bridge as a barrier to migration, 
But in recent years, the ducks seemed more inclined to raise as they approach and then fly over the structure. In northern New Brunswick, there's another great bay, another funnel. The scoters fly the length of the Bay of Chaleur until they reach its head. And here, at the mouth of the Restigouche River, they pause. Mike Lushington is a naturalist from the area. Going back, all oh, 15 or 20 years ago, I was in the habit of going down to the beach down at the Old River Bar here, just to the east, in the spring, and picking up driftwood and just sort of generally puttering around. I'd find myself out on the beach in some of this most impossible weather that we get in, in April and the very early part of May, fog, rain, snow, all the rest of it, but hearing this marvelous sound, this sound that I really couldn't even begin to identify. until finally one night I put together that the sound with these little black blobs swimming out on the water, which in my very poor scope that I had at the time, I eventually identify as black scoters and realized that they were actually an enigma even to some of the foremost authorities on bird and bird movement in, in North America. For example, these birds would show up in the spring, they would be migrating north up through the Bay of Fundy and up through Northumberland Strait, and then they were disappearing. Nobody really had any idea where they were going. Well, as I looked around, I realized that one place where they were going, rather obviously, and, and in rather large numbers, was, was right around here. No one knew about this vast migration of the scoters through the Bay of Fundy until the Point Le Pro Bird Observatory was started in 1996. And until very recently, little was known about the stop the birds made here to feed. The Restigouche River estuary has also been designated an internationally important bird area. Keith McAloney is with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Well, this is their spring staging area where we estimate somewhere between 50 and 90 percent of the population in the Atlantic Flyway uh, stage and uh, feed in the spring to acquire the nutrients they need to nest when they get further north. So they move up here starting in mid-April and stay till approximately late May, 1st of June, and then move to the breeding areas and they carry enough nutrients with them to lay their clutch of eggs and begin nesting as soon as they arrive on the, on the breeding grounds. So this is a key area for putting them in condition to complete their northern migration and to uh, lay eggs so they can reproduce successfully. We just simply went out every day that we possibly could and monitored what the birds were doing, where they were, what they seemed to be eating, uh, what numbers were involved, were they doing anything in the estuary, what were they doing here? Were they here to eat? Were they here just to hang around? Was there something else? Well, we discovered, yes, they're certainly here to feed. We took a kayak on a couple of occasions, went right down through the flocks, to found out that they were feeding mainly in a meter to a meter and a half of water, and that the main source of food seemed to be soft-shell clams. Uh, we could see all kinds of uh, shells that they were, that they were picking up and, 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 and uh, eating. We were also asked to determine if they were doing anything else and made a rather, I think it was, to my mind it was the highlight kind of thing. We realized that these birds were flying into the, the estuary in big large flocks and they were leaving two or three weeks or a month later as couples, as pairs. And that this was the huge spring courtship site. And we had a chance to watch instance after instance after instance of, uh, of pair making, pair bonding, and, and that really became one of the major sources of, the, of, uh, of interest and fascination for us to watch this whole process. Once they've fed, bonded, and rested here at the mouth of the Restigouche, they lift into the air, head north, and as far as we know, vanish. They don't vanish, of course. We know they go somewhere to breed, but where is the mystery?
The Canadian Wildlife Service wants to help solve this mystery. Working together with the United States Geological Survey, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and provincial and state governments, as partners in the Sea Duck joint venture, they place small, harmless tracking devices in a few birds every year. The devices transmit their signals to satellites. The biologists can track the signals, and therefore the birds, to find out where they go when they leave New Brunswick. But first, they have to catch them. And that's not always easy. Well, they're offshore in uh, fairly deep water, and in the Bay of Shalor in particular, there are no islands or shoals to break up the shoreline so that mist netting, uh, which we tried last year, was ineffective. So we're uh, resorting to trying to capture them at night with the light, which uh, requires almost absolutely perfect conditions in terms of flat, calm sea, uh, a dark night so there's no moon and stars for the birds to orient themselves so that they uh, react well and, and hold in the beam of light so that uh, you can dip them. So. Last night's capture was successful. The scientists at the Canadian Wildlife Service and the U.S. Geological Survey managed to net three black scoter males. They hold them in this pen until they're ready to surgically implant the satellite transmitters. The operation is carefully performed by a veterinarian. After, the only evidence of the implant is the transmitter's antenna that passes through the back of the duck using a surgical catheter. After the bird's recovery, they're released in the same place they were captured. Uh, they seem to uh, recover from the anesthetic uh, very, very well. And we certainly, from last year's observations, didn't see any changes in behavior, both uh, post-surgery up to release and in the way the birds uh, migrated north from here, went to their molting or breeding areas first, then the molting areas in James Bay, and then returned to... Uh, uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States from Nantucket Island down far as uh, Carolina to winter. Uh, we had no mortality from the radios, implants, and in fact, uh, as of the end of January, uh, nine of the radios were, were still operating and four were still operating uh, at the uh, end of March. So we got a complete circuit on the birds. something. Look at that side by side. We discovered, for example, that most of them head up into northern Quebec. Some of them cross over James Bay and we traced one female as far as a little west of Thompson in Manitoba where she obviously had her nests. That they congregate then in August in the lower western side of James Bay where they congregate there in numbers similar to what they do here and then they fly from there almost directly overland, either east or west, bracketing Montreal, for example, and end up in the ocean somewhere south of Boston, where they then spend the winter sort of frolicking around between Boston, Nantucket Sound, down into Chesapeake Bay. That we've been able to determine to this point, and it's just a continuing source of fascination. There has to be a very large unknown breeding area for these birds, so many of them, somewhere in the eastern Arctic where and uh, it's really my I would love someday to be able to be standing at the edge of some lake looking at a black scoter nest somewhere in the Arctic tundra uh, sometime before I pass on it would be one of my real uh, objectives in life would be to, to, uh, to actually be there and see the other end of this story over the past 20 years there's been a steady decline in the numbers of several kinds of sea ducks all over North America including those in the Bay of Fundy. Well, there's a lot of information that isn't known about what's causing the decline in a lot of these sea ducks, but um, it's theorized at least that, uh, you know, in addition to things like oil um, spills, small or large, there could be things like heavy metals in the soil and the uh, sediments at the bottom of some of the bays where these birds concentrate. And they do feed on shellfish, 
which act as filters in themselves for a lot of the pollutants that would be in the waters. And so it may be that the birds are picking up concentrations from shellfish, for one thing. Um, there is spring hunting sometimes in the areas that they concentrate here in the, in the Maritimes. And that's another factor that probably is uh, limiting the, the birds a little bit, although it's something that's been present for a couple hundred years, so it may not be something that's new. All of these things could harm the migration of the seabirds of the Bay of Fundy and the coasts of New Brunswick. But almost none of what we know about these migrations, particularly of the black scoter, was understood until the St. John Naturalists Club set up its observatory at Point Le Pro. Just finding out how huge this migration actually is was one revelation. There's still much to learn and there will certainly be more surprises. <laughs>